excited to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. Before we dive into this powerful episode, please remember to subscribe to our channel and give us a five-star rating on iTunes and continue hustling. This episode is sponsored by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Moguls, Chiropractic Rocks, True Weight Solutions, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, doTERRA, Sherman College of Chiropractic, SCED, New Patients in a Box, The Influencer Authority Podcast Training, and Prime Spine Consulting. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 307 of the Cairo Hustle Podcast. I am your co-host, Luke Millette, and here's your host, Jim Chester. So today we have the opportunity of interviewing Dr. Ken Harris, and if you want to hear 45 years of wisdom, stay tuned. Welcome back to another episode of the Cairo Hustle Podcast. We today have uh, Dr. Ken Harris coming in from Jersey today, but uh, born and bred in New York. And uh, I got Luke Millette, my uh, co-host, coming in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'm in the beautiful state of Colorado out here in Grand Junction. And today, uh, it's, it's second time we've tried to get you on the, the schedule with us. And today it worked out. So we're really happy to have you here. But before we jump into this interview, um, a little bit of house cleaning. We do protect free speech and chiropractic, so you're welcome to say what you like to about chiropractic. Um, we do protect the sacred trust with our message. So we are philosophically sound, and we believe in innate intelligence and keeping the lexicon as it is, and uh, protecting the subluxation-based chiropractor with their mission and vision to locate, detect, and correct vertebral subluxations. So with that being said, welcome to the show, Dr. Ken. I'm happy to be here, Jim. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for reaching out to us and uh, accepting the opportunity to come on to the show. Um, And 45 years in the making, um, how did you get into this illustrious profession of chiropractic? Well, I was fortunate. uh, In high school, I went out with a, a girl and her father was a chiropractor. And at that time, I didn't really have an understanding or appreciation for what chiropractic is. So uh, unfortunately, I ridiculed her father. I made I made fun of him. I, you know, I was very scientifically oriented at the time, and uh, I, I belittled him. And and lo and behold, she broke up with me. I don't blame her. But as life would have it, synchronistically, when I went to college from high school, the next girlfriend I fell in love with, I and I really fell in love with her. I said, by the way, what does your dad do? And she says, oh, he's a chiropractor. I said, shut your mouth, Ken, and don't say anything bad about chiropractic. Anyway, he gave me my first adjustment, and the rest is history. But I, I, I thought it was interesting how the universe, you know, gave me two opportunities to wake up. And the second time, having fallen in love with my current wife, Judy, of 52 years, I wasn't going to say anything bad about chiropractic. <laughs> and, and off camera, you said that you, you went to New York Chiropractic College, uh, but before that, it was called Columbia College? Columbia Institute of Chiropractic. It was on 71st Street on the west side of Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I think that that's a historical resonance with what we're doing here is we get a chance to make a uh, documentation of these interviews and talk to people about how they got into the profession and, and what inspires them. And I, I guess the next follow up to that is what what sets you apart? and What makes you unique in this chiropractic space? I know you mentioned to me you do some energy healing and uh, you, you really help your patients out. So what would you say sets you apart from the other chiropractors in, in the chiropractic profession? Well, er, early on, after hearing the chiropractic story from Dr. Reggie Gold, which I understood completely from the get-go, I didn't need a double-blind study. I didn't need the FDA, the CDC to tell me that this made sense. And uh, I, I embraced it totally. I mean, it just it resonated with my inner knowing that this was a, a universal truth, the relationship between universal intelligence, innate intelligence, and that we were the means by which we would connect uh, or remove interference to the expression. So I, I, I went hook, line, and sinker. However, after getting into practice, I, I realized early on, and I, I attracted very, very sick people. I was open. My consciousness was send them all. If they're alive and, they're, <laughs> and they got a spine, they're my patients. And so I got some you know, some really seriously ill people. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't limit what I was doing to a disease process, but many of them I found out needed more than just the adjustment initially. They needed other help uh, in terms of nutrition or in terms of meditation training, other things. But I, I was the chiropractor. I was very happy to, to restrict what I did 
to chiropractic. But I brought in other people into my practice. So I created a mind, body, and wellness center where I was the primary, uh, I was the only chiropractor. Well, actually, I had associates at different points. But I had other people helping to empower and teach the people how they could help themselves. You know, in our philosophy, we say there are three causes of subluxation, trauma, toxins, and autosuggestion. All those things result in a subluxation. Correcting the subluxation physically is the beginning of the process. We need to do that. But we need to also teach them to stop doing the things that get them subluxated. So I felt that I needed to bring other people in to teach them, again, restricting what I did only to the adjustment. So that made me different, I think. I was willing to embrace uh, a holistic approach to to, uh, my practice. Well, a follow-up to that, um, what do you think today is causing the – most subluxation within the people that are coming to chiropractors without a doubt emotional fear 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 is the is is the virus if you will and we know that when the head and the heart are not coherent when you're thinking one thing and feeling another you create stress in the system that's when the subluxation will result there's a conflict pattern between the thoughts which are electrical and the emotions which are magnetic or emotional and so uh The primary cause of subluxation, as far as I am concerned, is emotional disturbance or incoherence. Second would be nutrition. You don't think you don't think you don't think these things? Oh well, there's all kinds of toxins, (laughs) you know, air, water, EMF fields. Absolutely. You know, it's an overload. The body, the body has tremendous ability to adapt, but it's being overloaded, overwhelmed. Yeah. Overwhelmed. They're in sympathetic dominance too with the fear. They got the pedal to the metal. You know, they don't have any brakes in their system. And the beautiful thing about what we do, we can we can slow them down. Mm-hmm. You know, if you do a parasympathetic adjustment, you will actually reset them. Which yeah, they'll, they, they, yeah, then they'll go home and fall asleep. Well, they'll, maybe they'll fall asleep on your table. I've had that happen too. <laughs> so I've come in and they're snoring. They'll come back and they're snoring, which is a good thing, I tell them. Yeah, but more, more than anything, I was considering that this is causing poor posture too. Yeah, and the well, behavior I, the behaviors around it are causing uh, this, right? And the text neck syndrome, absolutely. But you know, Jim, I have found that the the uh, the traumatic causes of subluxation, the posture, the falls, and so on and so on, they're easy to correct. If if you if you know what you're doing, you can correct the structural things relatively easy. But if they're emotionally upset, they're resetting, they're defaulting, they're re-tripping the circuit breaker day in, day out. And those are the people that got to come back three times a week. I mean, we shouldn't have to have people be coming three times a week for the rest of their life. But because of the overwhelmed stress on their system, many of them have to come in. You know, I I get adjusted to this day. I'm 75 years old once a week. I get checked. I don't always get an adjustment, but more often than not, I get something done because we live in in a stressful world. And, and, uh, you know, I would, one thing I would tell patients today, if I was in practice, turn off the media. Don't watch TV, turn off the radio, turn off the media, go out into nature, connect with the field, learn some kind of meditation, learn to listen, because innate intelligence is is talking to us all the time. We're just too educatedly busy. We're yipping and yapping over here and not paying attention to what's going on within. So what would be some advice you would give to a fellow chiropractor who needed more new patients coming into their office? Very simple. Take care of the ones that you got. They're going to bring you the ones that you want. You know, everybody's worried about the the big client chiropractic. And I heard it for the last 50 years. How do you get more new patients? And I'd say, take care of the ones you got. They'll bring you the new ones. Don't be worried about who's not in your office. Be in service to the people who are in your office. Now, don't be shy. I was not shy. I would go out every day and meet three new people. And I would walk them, whip out my card, and tell them who I was and what I did. So you got to get out into the community, you know, but it's connection. It's personal connection that's going to bring people in. I never did a newspaper ad. I never did a TV ad or a radio ad. I didn't have to. I was blessed. You know, I got a cadre of uh, patients in. I educated them. I gave uh, what they call layman's lectures every week for 30 years. I never missed. Every Wednesday night, I had the the spouse and the the family come in, and I taught them what we're going to do and what we provide before I even began care with them. And then once they got the big idea, many of them became chiropractors. I sent a lot of kids to chiropractic college. But 
they understood that chiropractic was not a treatment for anything. It was a way to stay well. And people, patients used to say, hey, doc, do I have to come back? I used to laugh. I said, only if you want to stay healthy. <laughs> that was my retort. Only You don't have to come back. Only if you want to be healthy. Well, I, I like that you said that you uh, opened up a, a class and you taught people and educated people about what chiropractic is before they started care. Who did you learn how to uh, give that class from? Like, who are, who are your mentors? Who did you learn how to give away lecture from? Well, without a doubt, Reggie Gold was probably the best public educated we ever had in chiropractic. He, he could take he could take uh, newly newly graduated doctors and, wanna, and they'll be jumping on a table after listening to him. <laughs> So I, Reggie, I was blessed. I, I was in class with Irene Gold, who many of the, in this profession know. She's helped many, many doctors get their licenses to her educational program. But the first day in school, I sat next to her. We were classmates. And she said, you really want to learn about chiropractic? You come up to my house. And I went every month for 36 months up to Spring Valley, New York, where Reggie, out of his home, would give a, lay, a layman's lecture. And he was brilliant, without a doubt. Uh, he was probably the first, and not the only one, but the first one to introduce the concept of universal and innate intelligence to me. I had an epiphany when I heard the story. My third eye opened. I said, this is the truth. Again, I didn't have to have it proven to me. I innately knew it was the truth. It's like uh, the old Sid Williams line is, uh, chiropractic works just like gravity. You don't have to believe in it. It just works. Well, that's true. It's a principle. He and you know that's why I, sit, I mean I, I used to take care of Doctor Sid. He dropped the keys a thousand times. He says, "Whether you believe in it or not, it's going to happen." So Sid was not a mentor of mine, but he was a colleague. I, I considered him a colleague of mine. So you talk about Irene, Reggie, Sid a little bit. Um, who who's the next to be that person in the profession? Well, quite honestly, I, I don't see anybody on the horizon who carries that torch. I mean, there are some great, you know, some young people coming up the, the pike, uh, but I, I can't, I, I would be hard pressed to say I know someone who is outstandingly representing the torch that I was introduced to. I, and another mentor of mine was a, a Dr. Bill Bain, which many of the young people never even heard of, but he had the largest chiropractic practice, and he didn't call it a practice, service in the entire world. He had 3,000 patient visits a week back in the 50s. And when I met Bill, that was a whole other elevation or, or, or you might say an epiphany for me to the understanding how this all works. So Bill Bain was probably my my most influential mentor in my, my personal life. I was in a room with 200 people. He started to speak at the college. I started to cry. I was in the back of the room. I started to bawl my eyes out. And someone said, hey, doc, you OK? I was the professor. I was the valedictorian at the college. And I was teaching the class. And I heard he was coming to town. I says, no, no, I'm fine. But I just met everything I've been looking for my whole life. He just explained it to me. And so I studied with Bill Bain for a period of 10 years. And that's where I learned the energy work. But Bill was an upper cervical chiropractor. He, you know, he just did one bone, the atlas. He knew it was either right or was left. That's all he had to decide. And he had busloads of people coming to his clinic in Derry, New Hampshire. The reason he was in New Hampshire was against the law in Massachusetts, where he was from. So he had to move his practice to New Hampshire. And I saw it in operation. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was something to behold. So how do we harvest and nurture this new front runner um, chiropractic leader? How do we find this person? Well, I don't think it's going to be one person any longer. I think we're in consensus leadership at this point in consciousness. It's no longer a hierarchical uh, model. Uh, I started this thing called the Sage Wisdom of Chiropractic Council. And the reason we started it, I, I took the, originally had five doctors, uh, five men. Now we've got three men and two women. But we want to give back to the younger generation for free the benefit of 45 or 50 years of our experience in practice. They don't get it from the, from the teachers in school. They really they, they, they haven't been in the trenches and in the troops like we have. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So if you want to learn about the, some of the golden nuggets of what it takes to be successful in practice, go on to the Sage Council of Chiropractic Wisdom on Facebook. It's free and open to all uh, students of chiropractic or chiropractic doctors only. But I don't think there's any one person anymore. You know, there's there are several people out there who, who are carrying the torch. But again, I hate to sound old fashioned, but. I was blessed to have, I mean, I studied with Clarence Gonstead. I studied with Dijonette. I studied with uh, uh, Clay Thompson. 
These were legends. These people, these people, their lives were saved through chiropractic. They didn't go to become a chiropractor because they they knew they were going to become a doctor and make money. No, they were literally saved. Their their physical, and mental, and spiritual health was saved through chiropractic. We don't have a lot of those people around anymore. I'm sorry to say, a lot of the young kids come into school today. They know they haven't even been adjusted. That's the sad part. And remember, you can't you can't give away what you don't own. That's what I would say to the young people. Embody what you what what you're teaching. You know, get adjusted. I meet chiropractors all the time. I they, I say you get adjusted. He says, No, no, I don't get. That's for the patients. I don't I don't need one. And I say to myself, Are you kidding me? It's sad. And and there are very few of our schools that teach now. You know, the philosophy that that I embody, the vitalistic philosophy. You know, you got Sherman, you got Life West, you got uh, Life Atlanta, you got the New Zealand College. I just spoke to a bunch of students in New Zealand. They're hungering and thirsting for what we have, us old timers, <laughs> you might say. And I hope they I hope they harvest what we got before we leave because we're not going to be around forever. But there are some people like myself who who carry the legacy. Let me put it that way: the memory, experiential. It's not I read it in a book. I've lived chiropractic my whole life. I love it's you for sharing job. this. It wasn't my job. I, it wasn't nine to five. I went upstairs and I was a different person. No, I, I, I lived in embodied car. If you met me, Jimmy, in the first year out of school, within five minutes, I'd have you on top of my car. I'd be giving you an adjustment. First, I'd give you the lay lecture, and then you'd be laying down on the table. I, I mean, I was so on fire with, with chiropractic. I naively believed that if you weren't dead yet, or well, five minutes dead, I might be able to get you back up. <laughs> But, you know, it's like anything else. You become tempered with time. You become wiser. And and as I progressed in my practice, I did less, not more, and got better results. That's another thing I would tell the young people. It's not how much you do. It's what you do. It's the timing of what you're doing. It's your presence and your intention in giving that adjustment, whether it's going to be in the atlas or it's going to be in the sacrum with a thumb hold. I don't really care. But the presence and the consciousness of the one giving the treatment, that's really where the juice is. And B.J. Palmer in case you don't know who he was, guys, he was the developer. He, he said it. They asked him, why is two chiropractors giving ostensibly the same adjustment? One gets results and one doesn't. And BJ said, well, that's simple. The one who's innate is connected to the innate of the patient. That's the one who's going to get the result. And I believe that, and I know that to be true. I don't believe it. I know it. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. This episode is sponsored by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Moguls, Chiropractic Rocks, True Weight Solutions, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, doTERRA, Sherman College of Chiropractic, SCED, New Patients in a Box, the Influencer Authority Podcast Training, and Prime Spine Consulting. Let's hustle. So earlier you mentioned that you get checked every week, whether you I need an do. adjustment or not. I do. What are some other things that you're doing for yourself and your family to make sure you guys are staying healthy? I do yoga. I do. I'm, I'm a meditator. I've been meditating for 45 years. Meditation is not new to me. I walk every day two to three miles. I try to eat organically as best I can. I, I, I still, every once in a while, I'll have a pizza. Please forgive me. I don't, I never had a McDonald's though, but I try to eat holistically. Uh, and, you know, at this point in my life, uh, being 75, I know that there are going to be uh, <laughs> fewer, fewer tomorrows than there are yesterdays. So I don't let anything bother me anymore. You know, I, I'm at the, I got a little frustrated getting on here, but I said to myself, well, I don't get on tonight, I'll get on another night. But I'm happy I, I was able to get in. But I try not to let the external affect my emotional state. And that's why I don't watch TV, But by the way. Don't watch the news, folks. <laughs> it's not true what they're telling us. Yeah, the narrative is skewed to uh, a certain agenda. And and you know what the thing is, Ken, is it's so liberating for me to hear you speak about a profession that you've been a part of for 45 years and that you absolutely still love. and it really matters to me to have you share with our audience who you are and, and maybe, you know, spark a fire under somebody to say, wow, I don't need a television. Wow. I should go meditate. And a chiropractic, I don't even know if that's even acceptable anymore, having a chiropractic lifestyle. But I think that when people do get checked and adjusted as needed and they do try to 
keep themselves as hydrated as possible on on purified water and they don't eat junk and they don't watch junk and they don't listen to junk. They don't become junk. <laughs> well, what happens is because people are so inundated with junk food, junk messaging and junk behaviors, they become junk. And that's just it is we're a byproduct of our environment and that's epigenetics. And when people, when people inundate themselves with poor access to their field, they become poor versions of themselves. And there's nothing that can ever equate to a standard of adaptability except for removing crap from your life. And when you do remove the things, the stimulus that cause that mental fear, that subluxation we were talking about, the emotional subluxation, when we figure out how to start calming that down, now the body can adapt. And now it can hold the adjustment. And now the body starts to transition to this beautiful thing that is supposed to be as vibrant. And vitality is one of the things you said earlier. And when we can cultivate vitality into a human, whew, game on. That's when we start making change. Uh, I, I agree a thousand percent what you just said, Jim. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out for sure. You know, without a doubt, uh, on all levels, on, on, a, on a physical level with nutrition and on an emotional level with data. You know, be, watch who you hang with, too. <laughs> Birds of a feather do flock together. Find someone that inspires you and become their friend. You know, learn from them. Don't hang around with the, the stinking thinkers and the negative people. You know, <laughs> I, I, you know be, be, be polite but say, you know, I'm moving on. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to stay in this atmosphere where it's going to bring me down. The best advice I'd give anybody is take smart people to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn from everybody, by the way. We're all students <laughs> and teachers to each other. You know, I, I mean, everybody has something to give to, to another person. And you just got to stay aware, awake, and alert and pay attention to what they tell you. You know, because sometimes the universe will use Joe the barber or Joe the plumber as a, as a means of educating you about something you didn't know. I mean, I, I know that I don't know everything. That's That's the beginning of wisdom. I'm still learning too. <laughs> I don't think it ever stops. I was on the elevator with Clarence Gonstead back in the day, okay, in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. He had a beautiful clinic. They used to fly people in. I mean, he was the chiropractor's chiropractor. They would fly them in on an airplane on a private strip, and he'd work on them from 6 a.m. to midnight. So I'm on the elevator with Clarence Gonstead. I was I was a student at the time, and I, I you know I was very dutiful. I was had all my notes and studying and watching and paying attention because I really wanted to be good at what I did. And uh, I said, um, Doctor Gonstead, I, I noticed today in the demonstration, you did something that is opposite of what the book here says. And you know what he said to me? He says, Well, son. There's always an exception to the rule. That was the exception today. And I said, boy, I don't know everything. You know what he said to me? Neither do I. I'm still learning. He was humble. He was hum a beautiful guy. And, and, and I don't know if you know this, people know. But he was crippled with arthritis. He had rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, literally, his hands were all gnarly. But he was an incredible adjuster. He was just a, and, and totally in service. I mean, the man started at 6 a.m. and he finished at midnight. There was always room for one more. Yeah. And if you want to be successful in practice, folks, simple. Serve your patients. Be available. Be mm -hmm. there for them. The first question you should ask them when they come in after you do the case history, what can I do for you today? How may I be of service to you? Not what's in it for me. If you got dollar signs in your eyes, the patients <laughs> see that right through that if you're on the take. We're here to serve. That's the key to success. So what is some of your favorite ways to stay connected to your local community and to your patients? Well, I'm retired now, so I'm not connected on a daily basis. But w when I first got into practice, I was not shy. I went out and introduced myself to all the shopkeepers in town. I volunteered, as you can see, I like to talk. I volunteered to speak to all the groups, you know, all the various social clubs. Because the more exposure you got, the more opportunity you had to teach people. And if you talk to 100 people, maybe 10 of them would come in. If you talk to 10 people, maybe only one of them would come in. But once you get your cadre of, I would call you referrers, they'll build your practice for you. It's, it's not hard. If, if you take care of people, they're going to take care of you. If you ever go to a restaurant and you see the same waitresses and waiters over years, they never leave. You know why? Because the boss is taking care of them. And they're taking care of the people. So you take care of your patients and they'll build your practice for you. Sounds simple, but it is. 
people, you know, and, and the other thing, be alert. You know, when people tell you how how thankful they are for your help that you've done to them, that's the time you very, very uh, uh, humbly take out three business cards and say, hey, listen, Mary, there's got to be three friends in your world who could be helped by me, by what, for what I just did for you. Would you do me a favor? What, Doc? Would you just give them out and tell them where they can get help? That's it. That's all you got to do. Well, I, I worked in a clinic. I don't know if I ever told you this, Ken, but I worked in two clinics um, doing chiropractic biophysics work as a traction tech. And I can't tell you when the holiday seasons came around, it looked like we were a bakery, okay? Because the patients brought in so many baked goods. Like it was unbelievable. Like we had like a whole west wing of our office that was full of baked goods and cookies and snacks and whatnot. And, you know, we're all in the chiropractic arena. We're not eating all that stuff. And it was just appreciation. The appreciation of how many baked goods that we actually got was unbelievable <laughs> every year. Yeah. Like, people want to give back. People want it, but they got to be asked sometimes you got, they don't, they won't think about it unless you plant the seed. I, I guess the greatest accolade I ever had in my practice was women would bring their newborn babies from the hospital into my office. And when a mother gives you that little baby just born here, would you please check my baby? You know, you've done your job because women don't give it those babies without pure trust and love. So I would say that 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 was some of the most sacred moments I had having a newborn in my hands right from the hospital, including my own kids. They were born at home. I adjusted my kids right, right in the house I'm living now. So, you know, I, I, I've had a very, very rich and rewarding life. I'm very thankful. So who have been some of your heroes or inspirations? Who, who are some people who have led you to be the version of yourself that you are today? Well, I, I would say my mother and father, they were, they were my heroes. They were, they were really good people, simple people, but loving people. I mean, if my mother said a lot of, I'm, I'm half Irish and half Jewish, by the way. I'm a hybrid. And my mother said a lot of rosaries in the South Bronx that saved me from getting killed. There were a few times I thought I was going to die. And I know it was the, that prayer of my mom and dad. Uh, they were just good people. My father was a, a simple man. And uh, so I had good roots. I had a good foundation. But in chiropractic, as I said, Reggie Gold was one of my blessings. Bill Bain was another one. I like Sid Williams. I used to go to DE back in the day. He, he also had an influence on me. Uh, Dr. Pasquale Sarasoli. Some of you may know who he was, uh, a gentleman from Brooklyn. I think, Jimmy, you know who he is. Mm -hmm. He was quite a dynamic human being. And you talk about server. I mean, he, he was seeing hundreds of people back in the day when people were seeing five and 10 patients at a time because he was a lover and, and a server. You know, he had people uh, born and died in his office, for crying out loud, on the table. I mean, that's how much he loved chiropractic. He was not afraid to give a dying person an adjustment. And by the way, I did the same thing. I, I got called one day and uh, this uh, young man says, would you come to my home? My mother is dying. And she got adjusted by B.J. Palmer. I said, really? He says, do you know how to do that upper cervical toggle stuff? I says, I do. He says, do you have a, 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 a way of doing that? I said, yeah, I have a little portable headpiece. I'll come. So I went to the house. It was down the road uh, a couple of miles from where my office was. And I, she couldn't even speak, Margaret O'Haggerty. And, and she was frail. And I just laid her on a side. And as I went to take the poseology to do a toggle, a gentle one, the bone moved before I even touched her. And she took her hand up. And she just went like this. And she said, thank you. I walked out. The priest walked in and gave her her last rites, and she expired. So I, I said to the son, you know, I said, your mother got a dying wish. She got an adjustment before she left. And, and Dr. Pat used to say, there are no wasted adjustments. Even on the deathbed, if someone calls you, you go. Very few times during the thousand interviews I've conducted and held space for a chiropractor to tell her stories have I almost been speechless by the message of the messenger. And you are 100% right when it becomes the art of chiropractic. When the artist is real, people show up to get the art. When the artist is pure, people get connected innate to innate. And when the adjustment is flowing with innate, limitations, they, they go away. Adaptability increases. 
and the ability for people to thrive that's the truth of the adjustment. It works whether you believe it or not. It's not a belief system. No. No, it's it's a nervous system firing system. <laughs> it's a universal principle. I mean, any more than we believe or disbelieve in gravity, it's still going to work. You know, so, you know, chiropractic is, it, it doesn't hurt to have a belief around it, but it's not necessary. It'll happen with or without your believing. Some of the best patients I had came in not believing. Believe me, they were proven. They were from Missouri. My wife got me here. You prove it to me. I used to laugh. I said, I can't prove anything to yourself, but you'll prove it to yourself. But I would tell them, listen, this is not like taking a pill. If you're willing to, to come on to care for a minimum of three months, I'll take your case on. But if you're going to come in today and have expectation, you're going to walk out after 30 years of having this problem and it's going to be gone. I said, we shouldn't even begin. I was honest. I said, I don't want to take, take your money and you don't want to waste my time. Amen. So you have to, you know, I always in the consultation said, what is your expectation to the patient? That was key. What do you expect from our relationship? And if I couldn't deliver it, I tell them up front, listen, I didn't accept everybody. I mean, I, I had an open door policy. I, anyone could come in. But there were some people I said, I'm not the right place for you. You know, what you're asking me to do, I can't do. All I'm going to tell you as new practitioner is be true to the truth of yourself. Don't imitate anybody else. Don't follow anybody else's procedures. Own your own technique, whatever that is. Find one that you're comfortable with. But I'm going to tell you right now, chiropractic is beyond technique. All the techniques of chiropractic work, if the one given the technique is in alignment. That much I will say. And on that note, we are going to uh, end this interview. Dr. Ken, as much fun as we are having. It is time to draw this interview to a close. I want to thank you for finally getting on the show with us. This was a very powerful episode. Uh, what are some websites people can go visit if they want to learn more about you? Yeah, I have a I have a website. It's called drkenharris.com. And that's the word D-O-C-T-O-R, full word doctor, kenharris.com. And I'm going to give a little advertisement because I just wrote a best-selling book. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's on my website. It's called Synchronicity. The magic, the mystery, the meaning. And there are 24 stories in here of the people I met in my life path, from Wayne Dyer to Deepak Chopra, uh, and soon to be Oprah Winfrey, uh, how I was prearranged and given this gift of meeting the right people at the right time. And I became Wayne Dyer's chiropractor the last two years of his life. He was a very strong promoter of our profession. So uh, this, this makes for a good reading. And we give you a 7654 formula principle, how to have more synchronicities in your own life, because we're all connected. And that's the theme of the book. Well, I'll be getting your book. Um, I don't have it yet, but I, I've uh, ticked up my reading skills and I'm averaging one book a month now. And uh, this past year was my first year reading one book a month for a whole entire calendar year. So I think that that's uh, one thing that I'll get from you is that book. And I'll add it to my accomplishment list. And I do appreciate your time and your ability to uh, work with the technology and uh, reschedule with us as needed. And uh, make sure that you got onto a, a, a dynamic episode of Cairo Hustle. And you are episode 307. And you have given us uh, some great story and uh, added to this tapestry that we're creating, documenting the profession of chiropractic. And uh, yeah, you're uh, somebody that I want to stay um, close to long term. So um, let's let's make that happen. Okay, Jimmy. I, again, thank you so much for having me. And don't buy the book because I'm going to send you a signed copy, my <laughs> gift to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll take a photo with it and post it on social media like I do everything else. <laughs> great, great. All right, Dr. Ken, we want you to enjoy the rest of your evening, and we will talk to you next time. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate it. See you Adios. soon. Adios. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.